So this is uh, Second Corinthians for Beginners, lesson number three in the series. The Apostolic Explanation is the name of the lesson. And uh, we're going to cover 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 1, verse 12 to chapter 2, uh, verse uh, 11. So in our series so far, we've talked about the, the general background of the city of Corinth itself, uh, explained that it was a promiscuous uh, place, a very prosperous, uh, many idols, uh, pagan worship, uh, filled that, uh, that place. We've also examined the, the, the people, the church uh, that was established uh, there, made up uh, of uh, Jews and Gentiles. And of course, uh, you know, we say that, it kind of rolls off our tongue. You know, well, there were Jews and there were Gentiles. You know. But in that time, to put together in the same assembly those who had been converted to Christianity from Judaism, and those had been converted to Christianity from you know, paganism, and to take these two groups and merge them into one assembly was, uh, was uh, very, uh, very difficult. And the letter written to the uh, Corinthians um, you know, underscores the problems that these people were having, not only in living a Christian life, but just getting along together. Okay? Uh, we've also reviewed the way the book was divided, mostly instruction about Christian conduct in life and worship. I'm talking about 1 Corinthians. You know, we reviewed 1 Corinthians before we, we went into 2 Corinthians. Talked about the things that Paul taught in that first letter. Next, we talked about the events that took place between the writing of the first and the second letters. And it's important to know this because uh, you can't make sense of what Paul is writing about unless you know what the problem was. And the problem was that Jewish Christians began to try to discredit Paul and introduce new teaching in order to draw people after them. So last week we began the second letter by describing how it is personal and subjective in nature. Uh, it deals with what it's like being an apostle, an unusual epistle. Most epistles are, here's the problem, here's the teaching, this is what you need to do. You know, very, very, you know, Paul doesn't talk about himself a lot, but in this letter uh, he does. Uh, since, apostle, um, since apostleship is the issue, his apostleship being challenged by others, since that's the issue, uh, Paul talks about apostleship. You know, they're attacking his credibility as an apostle. So it's kind of, so he answers them in 2 Corinthians saying, oh, you want to attack my apostleship? Let me tell you what apostleship is like. Let me tell you what apostleship means and how you live this life as an apostle. So this particular letter um, has six parts, five of which deal with apostleship. Um, and so uh, last time we did the uh, introduction. Uh, then uh, Paul talks about the apostolic experience, chapter one, verses three to 11. The apostolic explanation. In other words, he has to explain some of his decisions uh, to these people. Uh, apostolic ministry. Here he really gets into, you know, what does it take to be an apostle? What does an apostle experience? Apostolic fellowship apostolic, uh, uh, you know, his apostleship defended in the last part of the epistle. So our lesson last week dealt with the introduction and the apostolic experience, which we said was suffering. Remember I said in a word, if you had to kind of uh, summarize a, a job or a ministry or something, uh, what word would that be? And when we came to the experience of an apostle, if you had to summarize it all in one word, it would be suffering. Which we said suffering and the benefit of this suffering being the comfort provided by God. In other words, the, the main experience of his apostleship was the suffering he had to undergo to exercise his apostleship. The main, um, the positive thing that came out of it, uh, he explains to the Corinthians, is the comfort that he receives from God as he suffers doing his work. So today we're going to look at the apostolic explanation. 
Now this is an interesting insight into the relationship of Paul and this group of people almost 2,000 years ago. You know communication? You ever get into a, a kind of a, not a, not a debate, but it kind of, you get sideways with someone. You know? And when you finally sit down and talk to them and they said, you know, it, it turns out to be, oh, I thought you said this about that. No, I didn't mean that, I meant this over here. Oh, I misunderstood. You know, it's always a misunderstanding, misconception of what the other person said and then you kind of run with that. Well, this is what happened here and Paul will explain this. So in chapter 1, 12 to 23, he responds to a charge of insincerity. People are saying he's insincere. The Corinthians, it seems, were saying he was insincere, even lying, because he had made a change in his travel plans. <laughs> it wasn't over some doctrine. It wasn't over some important theological concept. He had made a change in his travel plans and hadn't told them. And because of that, they began to charge him with being insincere and those who were against him you know, kind of took this and they, they ran with it. I mean, you think getting mad at the preacher for silly reasons is new? <laughs> the old saying, you know, we had preacher for lunch. <laughs> Well, they had preacher for lunch back in those days too. So let's uh, do a little bit of um, background here about the travel plan. And you're going to have to stay with me here, OK, because it gets a little convoluted. So here's the original plan. Once Corinth was established, okay, once that church was established, the original plan. So he's in Ephesus and he plans to go to Corinth first then travel north into Macedonia, and then return to Corinth and receive help from them in order to make it back to Judea. So the church has already been planted. He's moved on from there. He's in Ephesus, planning to go you know, uh, to Corinth, back to Corinth, up north, back to Corinth, get some financial help from them, go back home to Judea. This was his intended plan before he heard about the trouble in Corinth and wrote the first Corinthian letter. And in this letter, he describes a change in his travel plans without mentioning his original plan. Okay? So 1 Corinthians chapter 16, verses five to nine, describes only the new travel plan that he had, not the intended one, which is this one here that I've just showed you. So he only describes the revised plan. Here's the revised plan. So Paul sends the letter to Corinth and then he stays and continues to work in Ephesus. He eventually leaves Ephesus and he travels not to Corinth, but he goes north to Macedonia. And while he's traveling in the northern part of Macedonia, he falls ill. And while he's there, he writes the second letter to the Corinthians. During the interval between the first and the second letter, the Corinthians find out about his original travel plan and they accuse him of duplicity because he changed his travel plans without telling them. This is why the second letter, or in the second letter, he explains what his original plans were before he changed them. And we'll see that in a minute. So in this passage, he also defends his honesty against this attack. So we need to kind of understand you know, what's going on as we go into this passage. All right, so two travel plans, an original plan that he didn't tell them about, a secondary plan that he informs them on, they then find out about his original plan and begin to accuse him of duplicity. So let's pick it up. 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 12. For our proud confidence is this, the testimony of our conscience, that in holiness and godly sincerity, not in fleshly wisdom, but in the grace of God, we have conducted ourselves in the world and especially toward you. 
So first of all, he states that his conscience is clear. He's not a hypocrite, you know, when he says fleshly wisdom. Yeah. He's not a hypocrite, that's fleshly wisdom. Say one thing, do another. Say what you say in order to get your way. That's fleshly wisdom. His conduct, where and when he travels, and what he does while he travels, his conduct, he says, is guided by God and is proper in the world and in the church. In other words, the disbelievers see my conduct and they have nothing to charge me with. And in the same way, you brethren who observe my conduct, you have nothing to charge me with because my conduct is directed by God. As the conduct of an apostle should be. That's, that's what's not written there. Verse 13 and 14. For we write nothing else to you than what you read and understand. And I hope you will understand until the end, just as you also partially did understand us, that we are your reason to be proud, as you also are ours in the day of our Lord Jesus. So the information about his travel plans in his letter was what they were using to charge him with you know, fickleness and insincerity. So he asks them to accept his word in total, not just that some parts are good and some parts are insincere. In other words, everything I write is true. Not just the doctrine I'm writing you, not just you know, the theological ideas that I'm, that I'm proposing to you. Even the details are true. When I'm going here, where I'm going there, why I make a change, all of that is true. So you can trust me, he says, in the big things, the big important matters, the big teachings, but you can also trust me in the small things. You know, if you're faithful in little things, you're faithful in big things. He also confirms that what he writes is true and accurate, and they have a good reason to be proud of him as he is of them, even though some have wavered in this matter. Verse 15, he says, in this confidence, I intended at first to come to you so that you might twice receive a blessing. So he uses the word confidence as a word bridge. Uh, Paul's writing style was such that he would write about a subject and then he would, he would introduce a word and that word was like a stepping stone to another idea and that's how he many times would build you know, his epistles, his letters. Talk about one thing, mention a key word that has something to do with what he's talking about but also helps him get into another, into another topic. So he's saying, you have confidence in me as I had confidence in you when I originally traveled to you. So he says, the first, you know, he says, you'll be twice blessed. The first blessing was his first trip. And what was the blessing on the first trip? Well, he brought them the gospel. That was the blessing. Salvation was the blessing. Had he not gone to them, they would not have heard the gospel. But he came to them the first time and he preached to them. They were converted. The gospel was the blessing. Now he had intended to come a second time. That second time would also be a blessing, more teaching. In verse 16, that is, he says, to pass your way into Macedonia and again from Macedonia to come to you and by you to be helped on my journey to Judea. So here is where he explains his original travel plan, which was not mentioned in 1 Corinthians. So verse 17, therefore I was not vacillating when I intended to do this, was I? Or what I purpose, do I purpose according to the flesh? So that with me there will be a yes, a yes and no, no at the same time. But as God is faithful, our word to you is not yes and no. So Paul claims that his original plan was done in good conscience. And as an apostle of Christ, he's not a vacillator, he's not a hypocrite, he's not insincere. His yes is yes, his no is no. 
Nothing has changed. He goes on, he says, for the Son of God, Christ Jesus, who was preached among you by us, by me and Silvanus and Timothy, was not yes and no, but is yes in Him. So now he goes back to his work among them. The preaching and the teaching, the miracles, the giving of gifts. There was no vacillation here, there was no duplicity here. It was always yes and yes to Christ. Yes to blessing them. Yes to providing for them the gospel. Yes for giving them gifts through the laying on of, of hands. You know, he's saying to them, what? <laughs> he's, what is your problem? Some of you are able to perform miraculous deeds. Some of you are speaking in tongues. Others of you are able to interpret tongues. Some of you have the knowledge of the faith given to them through the Holy Spirit. All of you possess the Holy Spirit. All of you can look forward to the eternal life. What exactly is your problem here? How have I harmed you? <laughs> I changed my travel plans? So he says in verse 20, he says, for as many as are the promises of God, in Him they are yes. Therefore also through him is our amen to the glory of God through us. Now he who establishes us with you in Christ and anointed us is God, who also sealed us and gave us the spirit in our hearts as a pledge. So God never wavers in his promises. When God says yes, it's yes. Well, this same God has sent us to proclaim, in other words, to amen. That's the term he uses. This same God has sent us to proclaim these promises and through us reveal the glory of these promises, the gospel, the miracles. You know, again, the underlying idea here is think about what I have done among you. Examine yourselves and see what God has done in you and through you through our ministry and ask yourselves, has all of this been done by a hypocrite? He tells them, you know, we, meaning the apostles, we, not only the apostles, but we meaning Paul and his workers, Silvanus, for example, we and you, the Corinthians, have been united in Christ. We've been sealed, in other words, guaranteed. Our salvation is absolutely guaranteed. How? Well, God has given us the Holy Spirit as a promise. The point here being, but not expressed, that God's messengers do not lie or do not act in insincere ways. You know, the idea being God entrusts these powers and the, this responsibility to give all of this to you, he doesn't entrust that power, that ministry, to people who are uh, uh, unreliable, insincere, hypocrites. They've been sent to preach the gospel, to confirm it with miracles, to bestow spiritual gifts. They haven't been sent by God to lie and cheat and especially over something as inconsequential as you know, travel plans. Now in verse 23, he's going to begin to explain why he did change his plans. You know, the idea is he owes them no explanation. You know, it's like when you're, you know, your kids grow up and you have babysitters, you know, the phases they go through. You leave them with the babysitters, bye mommy, bye, have fun with uh, Judy. You, know, and you get a couple of hours of respite, a little break from the kids. Then as they get older, you ever notice some of you who have teenagers, you're about to go out, they don't need babysitters anymore. You know, they're old enough to take care of themselves, but now they're saying, where are you going? <laughs> well, when are you going to be back? You guys going to eat out? You know, I want to say, that's none of your business. It's the same thing here. Paul has birthed 
this church. Now they're saying, where are you going? <laughs> How come you didn't tell us you? I remember some of my, our children once, you know, we stayed out late, <laughs> 11.30 at night, that's late. You remember when you were younger, when you were 20, you, know, you used to leave the house at 11.30 to go out. Anyway, we, we came back at 11.30 and I remember, I think it was Julie, I'm not sure, but I'll blame her this time. And she said, where have you been? <laughs> what do you mean, where have you been? That's none of your business. We, we can come in anytime we want. Remember, we're the parents. We're the ones who pay the rent. <laughs> well, the, it's the same thing happening here. Same thing. So he says, you know, he did change his plans. This he doesn't deny, but there was a good reason for the change in plans. It wasn't based on you know, deceit or fickleness. He begins to explain in verse 23, he says, but I call God as witness to my soul that to spare you, I did not come again to Corinth. In other words, he didn't come immediately, but he changed his plan in order to spare them. To spare them what? To spare them pain. Pain. His first letter was harsh. His first letter was demanding. If he would have shown up in the middle of their trouble, he would have had the authority and the power to discipline them, but he wanted to spare them. Remember what was going on here in 1 Corinthians. There was divisions. People were fighting with each other for power and position. There was even a man in the church who was living with his stepmother. In other words, cohabitating with his stepmother. And Paul harshly denounces that brother uh, in what he was doing. And he also rebukes the entire church for their attitude towards this. They were just ignoring it. Well, you know, this is the, the times are like that. People don't look down on that anymore. You know? I mean, the same today, you know, well, gay marriage, sure, why not? You know, we're an enlightened society. Well, you know, the Greeks thought they were an enlightened society. And so the, uh, some guy, you know, uh, living with his stepmother, yeah, sure, it's, you know, we're enlightened. So they're going through all of this and he's sending, you know, he's sending a letter rebuking them and warning them. So he says, I didn't want to come right away while you were in the middle of all of this business, while you were sorting out your behavior, while you were kind of responding to what I had written to you. I didn't want to show up in the middle of that. Verse 24, he says, not that we lord it over you, uh, over your faith, but our workers with you for your joy, for in your faith you are standing firm. So he's not trying to be authoritarian or bossy. His purpose is to work with them to obtain the joy possible in the Christian faith. And he doesn't doubt their faith. They believe they're just immature. They're just immature, that's the problem. They're children in the faith. They're children you know, spiritually. They're spiritual children in their conduct. So we get to chapter two. He says, but I determined this for my own sake, that I would not come to you in sorrow again. For if I cause you sorrow, who then makes me glad but the one whom I made sorrowful? This is the very thing I wrote you so that when I came, I would not have sorrow from those who ought to make me rejoice, having confidence in you, all that my joy would be the joy of you all. And then in verse four he says, for out of much affliction and anguish of heart, I wrote to you with many tears, not so that you would be made sorrowful, but that you might know the love which I have especially for you. So his letter caused pain, both to the Corinthians and himself. He did not like rebuking them. I go back to my example of parents. What parent enjoys disciplining their children? What mother or dad gets enjoyment out of spanking a disobedient child or taking away a privilege or you know, say, all right, you know, the big weekend, you know, that's done, you're grounded. You know? I mean, no parent likes to do that. Same here, he said, I, I saw your behavior, I, I wrote you a letter to rebuke you. You, know? you think I was happy to do that? 
You were sorrowful and I was sorrowful. So it came, you know, both of them were suffering. He also tells them how difficult it was for him to write that first letter. And so he didn't want to be there before this had taken place. Uh, and so he changed his travel plans to give them a chance to sort things out. So let's keep reading verse five. But if any has caused sorrow, he has caused sorrow not to me, but in some degree, in order not to say too much, to all of you. Sufficient for such a one is this punishment which was inflicted uh, by the majority. So that on the contrary, you should rather forgive and comfort him, otherwise such a one might be overwhelmed by excessive sorrow. Wherefore I urge you to reaffirm your love for him, for to this end also I wrote, so that I might put you to the test, whether you are obedient in all things. But one whom you forgive anything, I forgive also. For indeed, what I have forgiven, if I have forgiven anything, I did it for your sakes in the presence of Christ, so that no advantage would be taken of us by Satan, for we are not ignorant of his schemes. So here he's talking about that man who uh, was having that illicit relationship with his stepmother. You know, that was like the crescendo. You know. And he was instructing the church to discipline this man, to, to, to separate from him, to disfellowship him. And now apparently in the second letter he's received news that this man has repented after being disciplined by the church. And now he's saying to them, you, know, you, you, you beat him up pretty badly, you disciplined him severely. And now that he's repented of this, okay, let's, let's go in the other direction, let's, let's bring him back, let's, let's you know, help him to recover his place in the church and his place in Christ. So again, Paul uses a word bridge to include another idea. He speaks of his own sorrow at writing the first letter to them, especially in reference to that man involved in an incestuous relationship with his stepmother. In 1 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 1, he, you know, he refers to a man having sex with his stepmother. His, uh, and I say stepmother because in the, in the text it says his father's wife. So if it's his father's wife, it means it's his uh, stepmother. So he was appalled uh, not only at the sin, uh, but as I mentioned before, he was appalled at the indifference of the sin by the church. They were just letting it slide. And he demanded that they discipline him. And if he refused, that he should be disfellowshipped. So in 2 Corinthians, he refers back to this situation and it seems that the church followed his instructions. And so concerning this, he says several things in the passage that I've just read to you. First of all, the offense was against the church, not Paul the Apostle. It threatened them, not him. You know that idea, there's sin in the camp? Back in Deuteronomy 23, in the Old Testament, one person was sinning, was disobeying God, and the entire assembly, the entire camp, you know, was being punished by God. And God says to Moses, there's sin in the camp, get the sin out of the camp. Well, there was sin in the camp in 1 Corinthians. I mean, of course, everybody's a sinner, but there are some sins that are so egregious that they, they're, they're, they're dangerous. I mean, if a man can have a, an incestuous relationship with his stepmother and the, the church lets it slide, why couldn't a man have that kind of relationship with his daughter? Why couldn't a woman have two husbands? Well, why not let two men you know, have a relationship? Why not have two women have a relationship? Yeah, you know what I mean? Where do you go from there? So yes, there's always sin. All of us are sinners. But there are some sins that are very dangerous. And this was one of them. So the majority, not, not, it wasn't unanimous, but the majority of the church was willing to disfellowship this man. And this, this punishment, if you wish, this discipline was sufficient. So they now had to reverse their behavior, now that the man repented, they had to reverse their behavior so he wouldn't become discouraged. Now he needed their love and their support. You know, sometimes it's, it's okay to discipline, but sometimes you know, we shoot the wounded. We shoot the wounded. 
There are many images of the, of the <laughs> yeah, very good, Mike. There are many images of the church. And a lot of times we refer to the church as a family, you know, but sometimes the church is a hospital. And there are a lot of sick spiritual people in the church that have illness, the sin sickness, to a, a, a lesser or greater degree. And we come here for healing, hearing God's word, receiving the love of the brethren, being encouraged. You know, and sometimes that's not happening in the church. You know, we, we, we tend to kill the wounded instead of helping them uh, to recover. So in this sense, he's saying, OK, you've done enough now, enough discipline. Now it's time to kind of bring this person back. Um, and he says, very interestingly, he said, the, the, the command I gave you, that was a test to see if you would obey. If they have forgiven, he says, he also forgives, so that Satan not cause division in the church. All right, so Paul explains one of the things that he did for which he was being accused of insincerity. His answer or his explanation is twofold. One, He's not a liar, he's an apostle. Apostles are sincere and their work and power and authority speak for themselves. And this should be the answer that actually every church leader ought to be able to give. As an elder, as a deacon, as a minister, we ought to be able to say, I, I certainly like everyone else, I'm not perfect. but I'm working sincerely to serve the Lord. Secondly, he tells them he did change his plans, but it was done to spare them a painful visit. That's the explanation and one that is in the character of an apostle and in the character of love. I did it out of love. I, I was supposed to come, but if I came when I, when I was supposed to, it would have made matters worse. So I held off a bit to give you a chance to sort things out on your own. And when I saw that things seemed to be sorted out, then I came. So my coming, his point is, so my coming would be a blessing to you and not an occasion of pain. So the fact that they handled a delicate matter properly and responded to his letter without his presence was proof that his decision to delay in order to measure their maturity and spare them pain, that was the correct decision. So this passage reveals a very common and painful problem Paul was experiencing, and actually leaders in the church have experienced ever since, and that is their motives are constantly questioned. You know, I can't speak, I can't and I do not speak for the elders, but as a minister in a leadership position, I can tell you how discouraging and frustrating it is to learn that church members accuse the minister or elders, whoever it is, of evil motives. That probably is the most discouraging thing to deal with. For example, that the, that the preacher does what he does because of pride or lust for power. Or if he neglects to say or do something, well, it's because, it's, it's because of favoritism or laziness. Or that when someone is left out or forgotten or offended, the minister actually did it on purpose. As if, the, as it, as if at our ministry meetings, when Marty and, and Mike and myself get together to talk about, you know, what do we talk about? Well, we don't talk about the weather. We talk about church things, how to do things, how to, you know, who needs help and so on and so forth. But you know, we don't get together and say, OK, who can we offend this week? <laughs> I'm really looking forward to offending Brother Joe. Yes, sir, boy, he really, I can light his fuse. Watch me. Maybe I'll, maybe I'll pen something into my sermon that'll light his fuse, you know, I really, no. I used to tell people, there's never, you know, so people would walk out and some, sometimes, and you know, among you here, uh, uh, and people would shake hands, thank you, Brother Mike, you know, well, you really stepped on my toes today. Oh, you were talking to me today. And I go, okay, good, you know, repent. <laughs> That's my answer, repent then. But you know, there's never a name on the bullet. 
preachers don't write sermons with names. Okay, this paragraph's for this guy, this paragraph's for that guy. No. It's too general, there are too many people. That type of close-in work, that type of surgical work, spiritual, that kind of work is done one-on-one -on -one in counseling or perhaps in a small group or a class where there, there's an opportunity you know, for feedback and you know, discussion. But service and uh, sermons and general ministry have to be general in nature because you're talking to so many people at, at once. Sometimes people feel, oh, he was talking to me. Well, good, maybe that particular lesson uh, has more meaning for some than others. Well, that's just the way it works. A minister you know, can handle the sorrows and the crises in everybody's family year after year after year. A minister can minister to the dying and help resolve disputes that never end. And most times, and rightly so, people in the church think, well, that's his job. He gets paid for doing that. He gets paid for doing funerals, visiting hospitals, listening, you know, uh, watching families fall apart through divorce. He gets paid to do that. But should there be a mistake or a glitch somewhere, an unavoidable circumstance or conflict, and we're always ready many times to assume the worst about his motives. And I'm saying all of this, am I getting personal? Well, yeah, of course I'm getting personal. But Paul was getting personal in his letter. And I'm getting, I'm getting personal because this is what Paul is doing in the letter. This is what he speaks of here in his letter to the Corinthians. And, and, and that's what I want to leave you with. You know, most men go into preaching or ministry because they love the Lord and they have a, a burden for the lost. That's usually the thing that's pushing them into ministry. And women, more and more going into ministry, mostly into missions and uh, you know, uh, teaching in the churches, uh, ch uh, children's ministry, so on and so forth. But it's the same spirit moving th these people to go into ministry. They love the Lord. They have a, they have a burden for the lost. I, I remember myself sitting on a subway and listening to, this is many years ago, before I, you know, before I went into ministry, but one of the things that moved me, and I, and I was sitting there in the subway listening to two girls talk in French, uh, in Montreal, of course. And you know, they were talking loud enough that I, I, there was no eavesdropping. You know, they, I, I think they wanted everybody to. And they were just talking about going out to clubs this Friday and you know, we're going to go to this club and dance and blah, blah, blah. And my boyfriend, well, I think my boyfriend's going to be moving in. You know, and she must have been no more than 19 years old or something like that. And they were talking about their boyfriends moving in. And the other ones were saying, well, you know, yeah, that didn't work out. We lived together six months, but then we broke up and you know, had an abortion. And I was listening to them talk. And in my mind, I was, I was saying, these girls are lost. They do not have a clue. Not, they are absolutely clueless about life, about God, about the Holy Spirit, about what life is really about, about death. If they faced death that very moment, they wouldn't know what to do or what to say. Not a clue. And in my mind I realized in the city that I lived in, three and a half million people, there are a lot of these clueless people wandering around. No notion, no understanding, nothing about God. And I remember that moment, it's a clear as a bell in my mind. And it was, that was the beginning of, you know, and I remember thinking, somebody ought to tell these people. <laughs> and then later on in my prayers, you know, I, I'm not saying God appeared to me, He doesn't work like that anymore. But the thought came into my mind, well, you're a somebody. What about you? If you know the truth, why don't you do something about it? And that was the beginning. That was my, the beginning of my long journey into ministry and now, well, 40 years nearly. Next year will be 40 years, full-time ministry. And I still remember that image from the very beginning. So, 
without more detail, try to remember, as Paul explains here, those who ministered to you. I mean, there are bad apples. We read about that in the paper. The media loves to report on a minister who has fallen, you know, ran off with the, one of the members' wives or something. Of course, that happens. But most ministers, they do what they do because they love God and they love souls and they care about them. Okay? All right, well that's uh, the uh, content of this particular uh, section of 2 Corinthians. We're going to continue next time. I encourage you to, uh, you know, I always ask you to uh, read ahead because I don't always read the entire passage. So read ahead chapter 2 verse 12 to chapter 7 verse 16 and uh, we'll pick it up next week at this point. All right, thank you for your attention. We're done. <laughs>